Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. It's just me and him at the moment. We know Rich is kicking about uh, because he's been here and he's gone. I don't know what Bruce said to him, uh, but it was short, sharp, succinct, and he disappeared. What did you say, Bruce? I said this. Look, that's what I said. Oh, you've documentary <laughs> evidence of it. Here he is. I see him. He's coming back. He's coming back. Speech bubble. And there he is. Do we all now? Can you hear Bruce, any of us? Say something. I, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Brilliant. <laughs> well, that's, it's a little bit like a badly dubbed me. Chinese movie, though, because you're, <laughs> the, speech, oh. the, the lips are moving before the audio, but this is good. But that is Bruce. <laughs> he is a bit like yeah. a badly dubbed <laughs> Chinese movie. That is Call me Bruce Lee. <laughs> the nation like of California. It. Can sponsor uh, Bruce. And I am referring to another Richard Richard, but I see you're there in the comments. So welcome to you and welcome the nation of California. And of course, Oz by Drone, who's, who's often there, often there. Look, it's just the three of us at the moment, Compact and Bijou. Um, I wanted to start, the first thing I wanted to, to start off, I think we're just going to have a kick around conversation tonight now, aren't we? Sean Wenland. Sean Wenland has been on um, the show several times and very sadly he had a stroke. Um, and uh, there's outreach for Sean. Um, uh, for for medical donations, I'm going to put it in the comments now. It is in the comments below. It's in the live chat now. So if you can help him there, that would be great. So if you're <laughs> if you're watching Sean, stop it and watch something more interesting and get well soon. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully he will get well soon. Um, and the next thing in the comments or in the prepared sort of things, go for, go fly prize has been the the. the that the first contestants through have been announced. Did it, either of you see those, and what did we think? I'll let Bruce go. Well, no, I've got nothing. I <laughs> <laughs> can't help there. Apologies. <laughs> there, nothing inspired me, put it that way. There are some mad urban air mobility uh, concepts in there, and it can only make me think of the, uh, funny enough, Boeing's a big sponsor, and the big one Airbus did was the cargo delivery challenge, which launched a million renderings. Uh, the eventual winner, uh, they did get a version of it to fly, but that was by some very clever people who got it flying for them, but it didn't go any further. And this Go Fly Prize, sponsored by Boeing, looks exactly the same. Go I'm on, just hoping they're not reliant on attitude sensors. Well, where do we start? Do we even talk about that? I mean, that is just just, just absolutely crazy. It, isn't it's it? actually interesting because it points to something that i noticed when they started building the space shuttle things have become so complex and there are so many permutations of all the possibilities it becomes almost impossible to actually prove that something works um in every possible scenario so as we ramp up the complexity we ramp up the risk because there's always a chance and when you've got pilots flying aircraft as we did in the 1960s and 70s that's one thing but when you've got software flying the aircraft if you've looked at the average geeky computer programmer you're probably thinking i'd rather have the guy with the epaulets thank you than the guy with the pizza and coke you know controlling my airplane so this is a, a situation that we're increasingly going to encounter where systems we're reliant on systems that are not totally proven but it but doesn't doesn't go a bit further back than that weren't, weren't they trying to do something with an airframe Air, you know, the, the, the basic of the aeroplane. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, they had to make big changes. Those big engines power up, nose comes up. I mean, aerodynamically, if you're starting at a point where you need the computer in the loop, we're not talking about a fighter here, which needs perhaps to be completely unstable to get itself into all sorts of positions in combat. We're talking about something taking your, your, your granny on holiday. You want it to be stable and a, and a proper aeroplane before putting the kit on, surely. Yeah, well, this this is, of course, from what I've read, that they, they put the software in there because they wanted pilots to be able to fly this aircraft with a 737 rating, not have to get a new rating for a new aircraft because they wanted to mask the changes to the aerodynamic behavior using software. And that's not always a good thing. Um, but increasingly, even just in the, the desire for increased efficiency and performance, the software is coming in because software can fly an aircraft so much better than a pilot can. And so whether you're looking at it from the point of view of just masking bad traits or whatever we're just going to see more and more and these these urban we're looking at drones you know you jump in your flying taxi there's no driver it takes you where you want to go you are 100 percent reliant on the guy with the pizza and the coke working at three o'clock in the morning in a dark room somewhere and you know just the comfort zone it's a bit outside my comfort zone <laughs> yeah yeah I, I, yeah i i i can't um 
I, I can't believe well I can't, I can't believe i can't believe it's not better but you know just that boeing is saying oh they've got a software fix and I, I put on somewhere on linkedin oh, i wonder if we can see it in github you know it's uh just putting a software fix it just that doesn't sit well with more than 300 people having died and just to say yeah those guys with pizza and cokes have, have fixed it. it 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 just doesn't sit right at all i'm a bit ranty on this aren't i but it they can't be allowed to get away with this or can they is this their um i saw someone say this is their uh comet uh, moment remember when they had the the square windows and then they had to have the circular windows uh before they fix the thing is this boeing's comet moment moment it could be um the thing is that when you've got a pilot in command of the aircraft and this was the sort of transition airbus had that from what i, I mean i this is what i've heard so it may be wrong but i gathered that Airbus's design mantra was, we will let the computers decide what's going to happen. The pilot's there just to keep them warm and, and drink coffee. And Boeing's mantra was, the pilot will always have the final say. The computers are advisory, and at any stage, it's easy for the pilot to take control back. Um, and Boeing seemed to have gone back on that with the MAX 8 by making it so difficult to turn off the automated system that it's flying like an Airbus. And that was the problem. Um, you know, Boeing pilots like to be the have the final say, but they didn't in this case because what they have 40 seconds or something to turn it off, and the, the, going through the checklist was incredibly took more than 40 seconds, so they were completely and utterly incapable of, of dealing with the situation. So, yet I think we have to go back and say, Who do we trust the most, the programmer or the pilot? And used to be if you trusted the pilot, you flew Boeing, if you trusted the programmer, you flew Airbus. Now it, the, it's not so clear cut. Wavy Davy in a comment saying Boeing should be up for corporate manslaughter. I agree, and I keep seeing articles that say someone's going to be in trouble. And I tell you, that someone is. It's the CEO of Boeing. That's where it should start. It shouldn't start with the bloke with pizza and whatever. It should be the very, very boss um, that should get into trouble. And talking about very, very bosses, I didn't actually introduce Richard Parker of Altitude Angel, the very, very boss of Altitude Angel, properly, because I'm those of you who've been here before, seen Richard before. Richard, when Bruce mentioned complex and uh, causing troubles is that something that's in your world do you think you have a very complex system you're thinking about do we like to cause trouble is that where you're going I mean <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well yes <laughs> but yes, it <laughs> yeah. but it but it, 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 it can't software save the day can you things be over engineered uh, are you making something simple difficult with your software are we talking about Boeing? I think no, we're talking about, we're about Altitude Angel now. Or about about Angel. UTLs. I think we've, we've got a really interesting problem because we have to solve how we get more drones into the airspace safely, um, not just now, but into the future. And I think sheer scale alone means that we have to rely on software and automation to, to make that happen if we, if we want to get the commercial drone industry that we're all really excited about. So again, I think anyone that's going to be developing software, whether it's the flight control systems on a Boeing or it's um, navigation support assistance for, for drones, um, has a responsibility to do hefty amounts of due diligence and testing and, and quality assurance. Um, and sometimes thing, things go wrong, right? I mean, mechanical things go wrong, um, but software things as well go wrong. Um, and it's a shame, obviously, that and tragedy that this particular incident with, for example, the, the Boeing aircraft has, has, has happened. Um, but the important thing is, well, there has to be a learning exercise from that and that can never be allowed to happen again yeah absolutely um richard in the comments saying also why would the second stall detect to be an option that neither of those airlines purchased i didn't realize that was an optional extra to have it, was a it was an expensive one and oh, um, it's not a requirement God. for a for an operating license to have the secondary so i think um you know, you, you've got cost savings and you've also got the fact that it's, it's not part of the regulation to have the optional extra. Um, probably means that that's probably why most airlines don't take it, right? Well, that, that must be where regulation and software have got out of step because if you have a system that if the sensor fails, surely such a critical set that can't you can't can't go on look um the cube autopilot has got triples this not hobby grade hobby professional grade autopilots have triple sensors for for model airplanes basically so how, how can that be that a sub thousand thousand dollar uh autopilot can have more sensors than the boeing in that situation uh, and i know stall detection is one of the problems they, they actually have for false positives in the autopilot world of actually getting that right 
um, and and not and so it's oh I'm, I'm ranting. I, can't, I, can't. I noticed that too. I couldn't believe it. I thought it's rated to a hundred thousand hours mean time to failure or something. So I guess that figure that's okay. We'll change about fifty thousand hours. But mean time to failure doesn't mean they're not going to fail in the first hour. It's only a mean time. It's not. It's an average. It's not a guaranteed to last a hundred thousand hours. So. I would have thought in anything where you are so critically reliant on a sensor, you'd have three of them because you need to be able to have a voting system like they do on the space shuttle. Because if you have two, then you never know which one's right. So it's as bad as having one. You might as well have three and then let them vote because the chances of two failing are much lower than the chances of one failing. And when you look Absolutely. at the number of failures I've had, obviously there is a much deeper intrinsic problem here uh, than just the you know, um, the software. The, maybe the sensor itself is failing. Uh, we don't know. But uh, obviously they need a much more redundant system when you've got hundreds of human lives involved. Well, Gorilla Drones is making a very fair point in the comments. If you're going to sell an unbalanced aircraft, which it was, and that's why they needed the sensor. You need to make the detectors mandatory and not optional. And that perhaps is where the regulator's gone out a step with the um, with 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 the software, as it were. They probably yeah, because they're aware. too busy making up drone regulations instead of dealing with the real problem. Exactly. But now Louis here, we can we can have a voting system. Uh, we're we're all set up now. We can be all legal. How are you, Louis? How are you going? Oh no, he's saying something wrong with his audio. Is he? This is a recurring theme tonight. It's a recurring, it's a recurring theme of this evening. What is going on, G Oogle? Um, yeah, Google has fixed something. Uh, something has been fixed. Yes, something has definitely been fixed. So, yeah, you the... didn't buy the optional audio interface. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, that'll be it. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, all the audio oh, is now being scanned for mentions of things that could get videos demonetized or upset advertisers. You notice YouTube has turned off the filters, so you can't filter by the last 24 hours or last hour or whatever on YouTube videos because they don't want people seeing the video that the gunman put up. So it's completely crippled YouTube for so many people. There's so many people complaining because I usually go into YouTube and I search for you know videos of a certain type in the last 24 hours so I can see what's new. You can't do that anymore. It brings up stuff that's years and years old. So this whole, and then you've got in the EU, you've got that new legislation that, that's going to cripple the internet because um, the, the platform becomes liable for any copyright infringements and things like memes are going to disappear. It's like the whole internet has just gone totally crazy. Uh, we're, we're losing our the freedom that made the internet what it is and I, I have grave concerns for the future of some of these platforms like youtube well yes <laughs> i haven't come to the party thinking about that yes. Yes. I side, side things didn't i well you know i mean i can get this demonetized well, i was mentioned in the in the before we started to, to richard you know we're, I'm, I'm soaring all the way up to like 29 30 dollars a month on this now so so i'm a dollar a day you talk about your hourly earnings there bruce i'm i'm on daily earnings of a dollar <laughs> has, it, has it changed you gary oh yeah yes it's frozen them <laughs> yes. I it would crash him when I asked the question. I wasn't sure if it was me then. But... Am I still frozen? No, the AI not. is taking a long time to process what we're saying. So it puts in pauses while it says, is this good? Is this bad? Oh, okay, we'll let it through. That's a little bit. Oh, no, Bruce, we might have to host the show. You might... Am I there? Sort of. Yeah, uh, from time to time. You're back now. You should have said, should have shared the agenda. We could have done it without you. <laughs> I, I did share the agenda. It shows how much you read. Anyway. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> didn't purchase the option of reading of that agenda, it's did you? Optional <laughs> reading. Absolutely. Yeah. So the Go Fly price and the uh, Urban Air Mobility and Boeing, Boeing, Boeing have their fingers in that pie. I'm very confident about that. I'm very confident they're going to make the right decisions and pick superb winners. Uh, so the thing I noticed was that there's, there's not a lot of innovation, is there? You've got people sitting in things with ducted fans or propellers, and there we go. You know, like, okay, Moller did that in 1975, um, but now it's just become more viable because the, the we've got electric motors and the powder weight ratios are good. But it's still not viable commercially because of many things we've discussed, such as the downtime on recharging and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, at this point, we have a concept, but it's not viable. And these... No one is going to be in a position to break over that magic, magic threshold until we get better batteries or some kind of breakthrough in the technology. It's all proof of concept at the moment. Mm. Mm. Uh, but Richard's obviously ramping up for thousands of them to be flying into central London to all the rooftops that people are snapping up. Yeah, we're dead keen. We're dead keen to support that kind of traffic, right? But only if it can be done 
safely and only if our automation systems can allow it. But and yeah. and flying a Matrice, it's not safe to fly over anything, is it, Gary? Oh, I wouldn't fly Matrice, no, no. <laughs> you read the agenda, didn't you, Bruce? <laughs> He's read the agenda, yeah, you see. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good. It's almost like we know what we're doing, uh, but not quite. The, yeah, the, another another little bit of quality control shocker for uh, DJI, and I believe that every single one of those ones that went in was uh, one being used by the police. <laughs> so, does that say uh, it's uh, does that say it's perhaps what the end user was doing with them? Who knows? Um, but yeah, I don't think DJI have responded to to that little warning yet. Um, uh, Question but, for Richard: On, on the um, altitude angel, are you guys going to eventually take it to the point where, if there is a um, a recall or a notification or a safety issue with a particular craft, if you know what the craft is, will you make that information accessible so you can flag it? You know, you got the green, the yellow, and the and the red based on certain parameters in Altitude Angel um, with the UTM, are you going to flag something that it, this could be a danger flying in its current position because it's not certified to fly over built up areas or something due to some recall? Is that a valuable piece you could add? Uh, I think when we already today provide information about circumstances that might mean the flight isn't safe. So for example, drone traffic, weather conditions, et cetera, and no TAMs that are changing or scheduled to change during the flight. I think it would make sense for us to be able to also, you know, if we know what drone you're flying in that area, if we're aware of any advisories, we could certainly put that in the pre-flight bulletin. Um, I'd say today, I don't, I'm not aware of kind of like an official source that's kind of global that all manufacturers put into and they kind of publish that information. Um, but we could certainly look for certain certain pieces of news um, and then publish them or even offer manufacturers an option to to ask us to broadcast that to our users. Um, but today, you know, the majority of folks who fly on our Angels platform don't actually have to connect their drone directly to us. So, you know, it's more about um, taking information from the pilot about the flight that he or she's doing today. Um, rather than the drone itself. But you can certainly see, you know, in the future, you might even have the owner of a piece of airspace or the operator of a piece of airspace saying, do you know what, I don't want to allow this drone to fly here right now because of this active safety issue. And what will be the criteria options. to... Options, good options, to, Bruce. Yeah, and what will be the criteria to for the owner of uh, an airspace? I can't hear anyone. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can hear yeah. Louis. I can hear Richard. I can, I can hear, hear Gary. Can you hear me, Richard? I can hear you now. I can hear Bruce as well. I cannot hear Louis. Well, and uh, now? No? Oh. There, there is definitely a change occurring to this platform as we're it's doing. rolling out while we're live as well. <laughs> it is. Can you turn the subtitles on? You know, does it have subtitles for Louis? Uh, well, no, but I'm hoping he can do sign language because, and I can read it while he's talking. I, I, I can't hear Louis, so if you direct a question at me, someone's going to have to okay. repeat it from Louis. Google's uh, just announced you... everyone must use Esperanto now. No. That was, that was Nava song, wasn't it? No, sorry about that. Go on, Louis, I'll, I'll relay it. What was your question for Richard? Uh, what will be the criteria of the owner of an airspace? To, to get included oh, on uh, uh, Altitude Angel. What would be the criteria of, for the owner of an airspace to be included on Altitude Angel? So today, I mean, we're rolling systems out for the operators of controlled airspace. So that's primarily the NSPs. Um, in some instances, it's not handled kind of centrally by the NSP. It would be handled, say, by the airport operator itself, if we're talking about the airspace around the airport, when we're talking about drone traffic specifically. Um, so it's, it's really down to the ANSP to choose to deploy that today um, and then tell us kind of who they want provisioned into that facility from a management perspective. Okay. Um, well, I, I, let's, let's, let's talk some more to Richard. <laughs> I've got some other things, but... Uh, the, the reason we were expecting the guys from the drone, I don't know why they're not here. And I, what I wanted you to do, Richard, was to temper my reactions to electronic or remote ID um, because I was bound to have an overreaction to it. And I was hoping you would be the voice of reason because um, I think we're, we're all a bit prone to that. I think electronic ID is, is, is rapidly moving to the front of regulators' um, windshields viewpoints i don't know i don't have the words 
and I'm very worried about it. I'm very worried that a lot of model flyers are going to be not for six with it. Already in the UK, with the changes to the um, airspace rules, that's all very good, and I think they're all quite fair. But what's happened is, is operators are ringing air traffic now, and air traffic are saying, no, sorry, we're, we're not going to let you fly. Because I think a lot of air traffic control and controllers and uh, control uh, little towers in little airports are worried that they are being given some of the responsibility for the flight which they didn't have before and i know of at least two model aircraft clubs that existed before the airport was planted near them that have had their very long standing um, permissions revoked and i think this is all an unintended consequence of those airspace changes uh, not perhaps promulgated very well to the airports and I'm worried that remote ID is going to be a further pressure. Now, that was a very long run. Remote ID, Richard, tell, reassure me. Ah, okay. There are quite a few elements in, uh, in your outpouring of thought. Um, but I think, you know, in general, I think the principle of being able to see more of what's in the airspace, from a safety perspective, probably makes a lot of sense, right? Um, I think the, sometimes that principle is taken a little bit far, um, and can apply to pretty much everything of any mass, um, flying for any purpose in any location. So I, I generally see a couple of schools of thought when it comes to um, e-identification. And the first is kind of, I guess, the very right wing approach, which would be track everything everywhere all the time. Um, and then you have a very kind of left wing approach, which is actually, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to tell you where I'm flying. And I think the right answer is somewhere in the middle. And probably if you're looking to fly in controlled airspace, for a particular purpose or an aircraft uh, or drone rather of a particular mass and above then it probably makes sense that you ought to be slightly more conspicuous in the airspace than someone flying for fun um, you know a couple of miles away from the airport um, you know 50 meters over the ground so i think there's a lot of angles that we can explore when we're thinking about applying a rule like remote id but then of course you then have the next question you know remote id sounds like a great idea but, but what do you want it for um, remote ID will help you identify folks who are cooperating with you. It certainly won't help you identify the folks who are not. And we, we don't seem to have the kind of drone traffic numbers anywhere in the world today where you're going to have um, the kind of situation where you've got enough folks who you can detect flying around you that are kind of squawking their remote ID so that you can spot the one guy who isn't and know that immediately that person's rogue. Um, so I think, you know, certainly in the future, when we get to much more automated decision making, um, perhaps even automated navigation, et cetera, um, remote ID will make much more sense in, in that regard. But again, in that regard, I don't think it's just about applying it to drones. Um, we ought to be able to have a much better system that scales well, is much more secure than the current systems for identifying aircraft in the airspace. But I think there is a challenge also with that, is you know requiring drone operators today or in the future to go out and procure some kind of stick-on device and duct tape it to their airframe um, you know, regardless of what that does to the characteristics like airframe warranty, etc., is an unusual approach to take to an otherwise quite highly regulated risk adverse industry. So solutions that the manufacturers already include um, make a lot of sense from a local um, broadcast point of view. Uh, but then we also have to consider uh, collecting that remote signal and potentially rebroadcasting that over the network in scenarios where that makes more sense than just having that remote local um, capability. Um, so yeah, there's lots of angles to remote ID. Um, and I, I certainly don't uh, don't have the view that you know we should be ubiquitously requiring everything that flies in the airspace to have remote ID today. Um, I think the next variable we've got to answer is, where is it gonna be flying? And do we care in that location if we require remote ID? I think that's, um, not only is it easier to deploy, but it's also easier to regulate for, and it potentially has the effect of catalyzing the market rather than um, discouraging folks from flying in those locations completely. Um, because again, folks who are not gonna be looking to fly in that relatively small region of controlled airspace, um, in comparison to the uncontrolled airspace, aren't, aren't encumbered at all by what we're doing over on the controlled side, and probably wouldn't be wishing to fly there in the first place. So it, not only is it easy to deploy, but it also, is the path of least resistance, I think, to the to the most number of users. But again, from a technology perspective, it doesn't really matter, right? We can turn it on and require it everywhere, or we can put it in areas and point out folks who are not using it, for example. But the 
so you can't be very popular at the Gutner meetings and other things then, because I don't think that's the popular um no. <laughs> popular I mean, probably not popular anyway, are you? So I mean that's the probably given, isn't it? But uh it's but that's 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 generally not the thought. Everyone seems to be rushing to ID everything. Everything must be ID'd, everything everywhere, all the time. No, no, because then you have too much noise, and and probably Richard is aware if there's too much noise in the system, it can it can mask the important information. And I don't know what the capacity of Richard's systems like, but if every drone that was being flown every moment of the day was broadcasting its position and uh, other information, you start running into to limitations and bandwidth and, and um, time slots in the thing you can have overload. So I've been thinking about this whole conspicuity thing, and and what I was thinking was. The current thought seems to be you have a little beacon on your on your drone that broadcasts its positions at at predetermined intervals, and I think that's the wrong way to go. I think we need something that's a lot smarter. I think we need a device that normally is passive unless it's pinged. So because it's no people don't need to know where you are if you're not in proximity to some other kind of risk. So you need to have a ping. So normally it sits on your your machine, does nothing unless it receives a ping, and then it broadcasts its position. So someone says what's around me, ping goes out, and all the things around broadcast back their position. So then you can build up a map. And if that center point may be air traffic control, they'll ping and anything that's within the controlled operating space will respond. So then they have control over the response rate, the number of responses per second. They can address individual craft. So you send out a general ping and you get, say, 15 responses. You then prioritize those. So you got one that's in a high risk area. You ping that one um, maybe twice a second, but you got something that's in a low risk area. You ping it once every 30 seconds. So you're in control of how quickly the information is coming back. And then the transponders can also be quite intelligent such that you don't bother sending your location until you're above a certain altitude threshold, which may vary in region to region. So when you ping out, you send out the critical parameters like don't bother responding unless you're above 400 feet or whatever. And so effectively, you make that transponder very intelligent to keep this, the noise ratio down so you can selectively get information from the perspective of something like Altitude Angel and the UTM. And then you can have the much heavier numbers of, or much higher numbers of craft being controlled and monitored because you're excluding the stuff that doesn't matter instead of having to just disregard all that stuff that's coming in. What do you think, Richard? I'm still parsing some of those suggestions, but I think in principle, what you're talking about um, has, has a lot of sense to it, but I think there is a challenge there in that the solution that you proposed where you have a kind of everything is silent until it's pinged actually doesn't solve the, the scale issue, right? Because actually, if you, if you took the example that you send out a broadcast from a central location like a, a ping on a sonar of some description, everything that receives that is then immediately going to transmit back to you. So you don't actually have control over the rate. What you do have control over is when things talk to you, but they're all going to talk back at the same time, whether you've got one or a million objects in that area. Um, I then agree that you could be a little bit more selective. Once you know what's there, you could have a protocol which requires that you can then talk specifically to one vehicle. Um, but again, I think this is the limitation of a broadcast-based uh, system where you, know, you are always going to have RF limitations. Um, and there are solutions and workarounds for that and protocols that will enable alternatives. But I think in general, again, the principle, uh, the principle from as a UTM being able to see drones um, as they fly makes more sense um, on the UTM side than it does potentially on the ATM side because drones are capable of flying um, sort of much lower to the ground and changing direction much more quickly. And, you know, when your whole legal flight is maybe 500 meters, you don't really have a lot of tolerance and variance for the time between updates. You can do a lot between pings, if you see what I mean. Um, so we have to kind of understand, again, you know, remote ID is just a mechanism for identifying the aircraft. It's not necessarily the mechanism for authenticating that aircraft. Um, but it also has knock-on effects, changing that rate at which people talk to you, changing how you see what's going on around you for other users of the airspace who are not drones. So a classic example there would be if we require drones to only tell us about their location when we become interested in it, how do we know that we should be interested enough to ask if we don't know where it is in the first place? Um, classic example there would be you've got a police helicopter operating in the area. The police helicopter is obviously going to be interested in everything flying around it. So it's going to send out one of these pings or have ATC do it for them. And then you're going to get the same problem you know, happening in, in near real time. The police helicopter is going to want to know where everything is very, very quickly in, um, you know, at a very high update rate versus every other normal scenario when there isn't a police helicopter there. So it kind of goes beyond just drones, this one, I think. And it comes more down to the policy of how we 
how we manage that airspace and what we what we want from those things. But um, the popularity question, I think, was an interesting one, by the way, because I think right now in UTM land, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of desire from a lot of different folks to sort of land grab different different chunks. And I think you know, registry from a technical perspective is not a particularly difficult piece of technology to build. Um, as a lot of folks have pointed out, you know, in the internet, we've been pretty good at building very large distributed databases for many, many years since the advent of the, of the internet. It's called the domain name record system. Great example of a, of a sort of decentralized system to a point. Um, but it works well and we understand how it works and it enables billions of devices to connect and it, and it scales quite well. Um, so the technical side of, of um, registration is very, very easy to, to solve. Um, what's less difficult to solve is who should we register and why and what information do we collect and how do we share it and who do we share it with and why are we doing this? You know, um, you know, online in the UK um, on April 11th, we're bringing in, in uh, line with our partners, and that's the airspace user portal. That doesn't require a registration nationally, right? That requires registration for you the first time that you wish to fly in controlled airspace. Um, and we're only collecting that information to service your request and then make it easier for you guys to come back and file those again on subsequent occasions. That's very different, for example, to establishing a national registry or requiring that it's done in a particular way. Now, at our um, company, um, our approach is not necessarily to be the drone registry. It is, yeah, okay, we can provide a drone registry if you wish, or we can connect to a registry that's already in place. Um, and I think that should be the approach that the folks in the UTM system take. Um, you know, being the operator of a registry is different to being the owner of the data in the registry. And our view certainly is from a drone perspective today, a drone pilot's perspective, the only person who should own that data really is the drone operator. And the drone operator gets to choose which UTM company it sends it to, um, as opposed to the default situation being the UTM company owns all of your data. <laughs> it's a very different um, approach. So I think, you know, there is, a, again, a huge desire in UTM land for a lot of different companies to pitch technologies, solutions, um, to identity as a foundation layer. But, but the point for us is identity is a, is a source of something that is a requirement in the, in the UTM industry. Um, but it doesn't matter whether we are the source originating that or we're connecting to someone else, just that if it's required to know who is the owner of that aircraft in a particular area, then that needs to be available. Um, either by us or by some other UTM company. And it's less important to all agree on the registry standard than it simply is to publish the standard we're each using and then enable others to connect into that remote standard. And, and, now, was, uh, and now something round enough answer for all of the different questions I heard in the original, in the original statement. Now a question from the left fields. Uh, if you can relay the question, uh, Gary. Uh, because what I'm seeing now is insurers, guys that sell um, paper uh, insurance by the usage, uh, coming up with uh, some kind of restriction of the air flights uh, on their apps. So you get, uh, we got uh, an announcement this week. Uh, insurers coming up with restrictions. Go translate. Thank you, Bruce. That's enough. <laughs> Um, uh, insurers coming up with quotes or restrictions of their own, I guess, based on their own data. Is that where you were going, Louis? Exactly. exactly. So the insurance companies are coming up with some kind of uh, uh, airspace management. So insurance coming up with airspace management. How does that work? I'm not quite sure I understood the question, but I'll, I'll apply an interpretation and answer that, and then you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, Louis. But I think what you might be referring to is um, some insurance are kind of setting a policy for what they need a drone operator to do in order for their insurance to be valid or in order to get a discount. Um, in some instances, we've seen that that means um, you must declare a flight with the uh, drone, uh, drone insurer's app before you fly. In other instances, it could mean you've got to fly with kind of telemetry enabled. Um, I don't think it's down to an insurance company, though, to decide how a nation chooses to manage its airspace and how it wants to roll out UTM. I think those are very different things. Um, and I think today, from a policy perspective, again, there, there is more than is going on in the drone industry um, that would, uh, would have an effect on what we choose to do with the integration of drones in controlled airspace than just drones themselves. And that's the wider questions around conspicuity more generally, um, particularly from a GA perspective. You know, there's still 
who knows of GA traffic that, that flies around that, that isn't effectively visible or identifiable except under any other conditions than, than VLOS or, or with a radar. Um, so it makes it very awkward to have that improved safety culture that everyone's going for, that improved visibility. Um, I want to circle back on something as well. I just realized I've been busy typing notes of the bits that come out of Gary's mind uh, at different times. And one of the things you asked about was um, uh, when uh, a drone operator requests to fly in a certain location, you're seeing airports um, that are perhaps you know, refusing to do that because they're worried that you know, they're going to be somehow taking responsibility. Again, I think you know, the interesting thing about uh, certainly here in the UK is you know, the A&O changes have come in but nothing here has stopped the drone operator still being responsible for his or her flight um, and remaining compliant. But the AUP system that's coming online is very clear. When you apply for permission, you're not getting an, um, a clearance to fly in the ATM terms, you're getting an approval to fly. Approval doesn't kind of take ownership and a requirement for the ATC guys to look after you. Hang on, hang on. Let me stop you before I forget. AUP, un unpack your right? And is that something that we don't know about then as an industry? Um, it might be something which you if haven't you heard a lot about. You just, if you just said something you're not supposed to have said. AUP, well, what's that about then? So have, have, have air traffic controls. I know Southampton is getting hammered by users at the moment because they're not allowing flights. And they're, they're being the most uh, most difficult. Um, so have Southampton read another bit of paper that we don't know about yet? Uh, no, I don't think Southampton have probably read something you don't know about. But what I can tell you is, um, uh, taking a step back on April 11th, and this is publicly available information, NAPS have talked about it, it's in the aeronautical information circular. Um, on April the 11th, um, NATS is releasing Airspace User Portal, um, the updated version which goes live to six evaluation airports here in the UK initially with a view to rolling those out um, to all airports here in the UK by the end of the year um, to enable drone operators to request permission to fly in those new extended FRZs that, that we've all seen in the, in the UK news recently. So those are you know, the, the 5km uh, bubbles around, um, around most airfields. Um, there are a few exceptions to that, but effectively that means that um, you know, using AUP, a drone operator will be able to immediately request and easily request permission to fly in that controlled airspace and have a series of automation rules applied to that and where the automation can't make a decision for NATS to get involved in and the airport to get involved and actually potentially more parties than just the airport itself to get involved, security services, etc., to decide how to handle the request. Um, now, this is helping NATS prepare for the fact that actually, not only have they now got more airspace effectively to deal with from a drone perspective, um, but actually to prepare for the future of automated flights here in the UK, um, where you're going to have many, many uh, drones requesting permission to fly or transit through controlled airspace and needing various different um, mechanisms to do that. So you've got an immense capability in AUP coming online to allow a drone pilot to simply say, I, I would like to fly over here in this controlled airspace on this time and then to get a, a, um, a permission, effectively, or an approval to do that or not. Um, and then for the ATM folks who are managing the airspace on that day in that location, to be able to interrogate that approval and see all the information about that flight in real time, um, that's a very low touch mechanism. Effectively, it's communication between the drone pilot and the ATM um, audience today. Um, but it's easily extendable to include telemetry and other services and surveillance information when it's required um, as well. So it starts to lay the foundations for a really healthy um, mechanism between drone operators, airport operators, NATS as the ANSP and other services that need to get involved to go and get that approval to fly and control airspace. Um, and I think it, there are, as I say, six airports initially coming online um, on the 11th. Um, one of which is Heathrow Airport, and I'm just trying to get the full list for you now. So on April 11th, we'll have London Heathrow Airport, which is the UK's busiest airport. We have Manchester Airport, which is the UK's third busiest airport. Luton Airport, the fifth. Cardiff Airport, Southampton and Goodwood are the initial um, evaluation airports coming online. Now, alongside all of this, you've got this fantastic user interface that makes it really simple for folks to just rock up and, and request permission. Um, but there is going to be later in the year a developer API to allow any applications developer or drone manufacturer or other UTM 
to be able to submit those requests electronically directly into the NATS AUP system. So you have a really bold move, a really innovative move being made by the ANSP here to open up, you know, digitally open up access to the airspace while still allowing them the oversight that they need and the tools that they need to be able to deal with the volume and to deal with it safely. And it's given them a really good platform to decide, you know, how do they then bring on more automated drone flights? How do they do more complex operations like BB loss, et cetera, um, over the coming months and years? So I think it's a set, it sets a good example for, for how this stuff could work. In, in, the, in the questions from Gorilla Drones, is this why more ATCs are appearing on the non-standard NSF uh, pull-down menu list at the moment? So are we at some sort of little hinterland here then between between the, this rolling in and um, is, is this where all the confusion is coming from? I'm not, I'm not putting this very well. I'm, I'm thinking hard about this as I do it. So obviously you, you've got the insider info on this. You're just the man. I don't, I didn't even, I hadn't caught up with this, this idea that this was coming. Um, so are these permissions instantaneous permissions, or if I've got, if I'm doing a job in in ten days' time, would I be as well to put in my application ten days in advance, and maybe it's more likely, and maybe, well, maybe on the day there is a special flight going through, and there's a good reason that that I shouldn't get that permission. How, how would it would 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 if I had something ten days down the line, would they also help clear the airspace for me in in that ten or twenty one days, as Gorilla Drones is saying? Uh, yeah, so you can you can file your request in advance. Um, I think there is a minimum requirement that Nats are about to publish for how um, how late you can leave it. Um, you know, certainly today, for example, for a Class D pre notifications for GA, which the platform is currently handling, there are time limits for when you need to do that. I think, and don't quote me on the GA ones, but I think the, the minimum time frame between uh, request and flight is an hour. Um, I don't know how that changes from a drone perspective, but certain airports and certain facilities have the facility within the software to change those defaults so they can choose. But the view is that actually once there is an implementation phase where it's been deployed and we're understanding what the volume of requests coming in is and where those requests are coming in within the controlled airspace volume, um, we can then work out what might be an appropriate set of automation rules and the airfield itself or NATS can, can apply more generally um, a blanket approval to fly certain types of operations that meet certain types of criteria. Um, so they can choose from a, a huge list of um, variables effectively to create that automation. But I think there is a view still today that actually the manual process is still quite um, challenging now and it requires a lot of um, involvement back and forth with ATC. Um, and potentially NATS and other bodies and security services, etc. This step is the first step at making that digital and making it therefore auditable and a bit quicker. Um, that allows NATS to monitor how this is working and then decide what the appropriate set of automation rules would be. So, is, so are you, I'm glad you mentioned because I was going to ask you, uh, does general aviation do this? Now, here's my cheeky question as normal. So is this the thing that you've had running in the background in some places anyway? For a while, because you've told me a while ago you had a general aviation thing, or is that uh, too? Yeah, so actually, that that's also public. It's not a, it's not a secret. In fact, you can you guys can go have a look at it right now. It's available at aup.nats.aero, and on the eleventh of April, that's going to change to include um, you know additional uh, functionality. But um, today, it's primarily serving um, the Nats non-standard flight request process. Um, so actually, it's like I say, it, it's not necessarily just for um, for drones at all. You can file a flight to you know fly a helium balloon or something. Um, but um, again, from a um, airspace user portal perspective, coming back to that time frame, um, you have the opportunity to file for approval in principle before the day of your flight, and then on the day of your flight, a subsequent approval from that facility on the day. So you kind of have your pre approval your your, um, your agree approval in principle rather, which the ATM guys can then call up on the day of your operation. They've got their your contact information in front of them. They can contact you if they need to, and then you can effectively get that approval on the day as well. So you, it should make certainly the approvals on the day more or less um, uh, you know much much easier than they are now. And um, it had been asked in the comments by FX and no, someone should write a plug-in for Mission Planner. Altitude Angel's already in uh, Mission Planner. Will this, uh, will, this, uh, will this end up being part of the in Mission Planner as well? 
And yeah, so from, from our perspective, we're, um, we're dead keen to make sure as many folks who want to fly drones um, in those areas where there are rules that, that say you can't fly here unless you get permission, this service that we're looking to online um, will absolutely make that process available to every one of our clients, every one of our apps, every one of our drone safety map clients um, will, will be able to do that. Um, and that's because NATS have chosen when they deploy our airspace management operating system, guiding UTMOS, um, they've chosen to enable a public API on that. Um, but this is an evaluation initially, so there will be an implementation period where NATS effectively um, are selecting who can do that and when, and what are the requirements for onboarding a lot, uh, a lot like actually the FAA did onboarding partners into the LANS program. So, you know, there's a good corollary here. This is very similar to FAA's LAMS, but it also lays the foundations for immediate interaction with ATC, much more automated communications and real-time comms between various different parties on the ATM side as well as the drone side as well. We saw that in your, oh, I'm not letting anyone have a word in edgeway. So we saw that on your Madrid uh, video that you had, uh, where the, I'm guessing that's kind of all part of that, where the controller could actually call the operator and say hey hang on a minute or whatever uh, but yeah. it, and it created something that i know from the old world of air traffic which is like an, a, 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 a modern electronic flight strip i used to write them out um that goes down on a board and it's uh, so it's very uh what do i want to say it is it would be very intuitive for the controller the controller won't uh, feel it's that different it's not like he's doing something in a different way to accommodate the drone he just knows about it gives him his permission and away he goes. So a like, lighter like touch on the controller is a busy, busy workload. And I'm well, just going to make you another, sorry, go ahead, uh, Louis. Uh, no, um, besides the question I posted on the left for you to, to, to throw at Richard, um, uh, isn't also the purpose of these UTM systems uh, a trial run to replace air traffic, human air traffic controllers? Oh, he's, he's saying our UTM is to replace human air traffic controllers. And that's a, he took that as the song goes, he took the words right out of my mouth. When we're talking earlier about electronic conspicuity and how things are done now, I was thinking, but we are, we are trying to, to make our world conform with something that's been done like this for about 50 years with some of the modern, modern ways they're doing it. And is it the right way? Should we be moving airspace forward in this way anyway? You know, it, it does seem ridiculous to conform with a system that should be gone, no GA below 2K, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, are you gonna replace air traffic control, Richard, is Louis' comment, really? I mean, predict, predicting the future is part of my role, but that would seem to require going quite far out into the future. But I think it's fair to say, you know, there's a lot that's happening in the UTM industry today from a technology perspective that um, excites um, and also frightens some folks in the ATM industry. There is a lot of um, similarity to what we need to do in the UTM world today, but it isn't at the level of safety that's required of manned aviation traffic management today. So I think it's going to be a long time before you you can even start to earn that kind of reputation technologically and commercially to be able to even think about becoming effectively a, a more modern um, ANSP provider doing GA as well and commercial and civil traffic um, outside of the world of drones. But also remember, we're solving different problems um, for different densities, at different altitudes, etc. So it may not be that that's the eventual conclusion. Um, but Louis made a point don't. actually in the comments, which um, I said to him, make sure I come back to, so I'll take that opportunity now, because Louis said, you know, actually this kind of um, voluntary uh, requirement of a drone operator to file permission for flight and controlled airspace only really works providing they actually do that. And clearly from an airspace management perspective, the risk isn't necessarily mitigated unless the airspace manager, you know, this, just say the airport, for example, um, have some kind of detection system that allows them to see who's in that area that hasn't flown permission. Now, I think that's a really interesting point because today you've got a lot of drone detection technologies which can tell you, I can see drones, but they can't tell you which ones are the ones that have been authorized. And that's a lot of the work that we've been doing um, in the technology that powers at the airspace user portal today is to be able to take and correlate different sensor feeds from a surveillance perspective and then blend them with those permissions that are, um, or sorry, those approvals that are being granted by NAPS in this case and the airport 
and then working out which of the pings that we're seeing are likely to be the ones that are associated with the permissions that have been granted. Now in time, and this goes back to Bruce's point, you know, actually it'd be really great if in the filing of your request, you were to put in your remote ID so that we can correlate them more digitally than um, sort of matching patterns today. But we have to think about, you know, we, we don't have the ability to shut the airspace down on, you know, Friday, Friday night at 5 p.m. and then Monday morning come on board with a brand new way of doing it. We've got to we've got to slot in with the status quo and we've got to start making incremental um, improvements to that and optimizations to that um, that gradually bring online new capabilities in a proven, in a proven and, and reliable way. Um, so that's why you're going to see this staged rollout. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm on a bit of a roll at the moment as well because I've got everything that's been written in front of me here. I've got the chat open as well. And I can see someone said, you know, should we be putting in this in, in Mission Planner? Um, yeah, I mean, just to remind our friendly open source community that it is open source, so you don't have to wait for Altitude Angel to, to update Mission Planner. Um, what you need Alt Altitude Angel to do is to give you the API documentation so you can go and do that. Um, and we're excited to be able to do that over you know the next few months when Nats decide they're ready now to start onboarding API participants. Perhaps one of those API participants, if we're lucky, um, will we'll be out of angel and then we can work with the folks who already have our software out there to start implementing that under the API. Um, so that you will have that functionality um, within um, any out angel connected system to be able to request that permission. So that's only what we would like to see. But I want to stress as well, um, from our perspective, yeah, we're doing an awful lot of work with our friends at NAS today, um, but there are other countries that are deploying technologies to do similar things. Um, obviously, notably in the US, you have LARPs, um, um, you also have uh, systems coming online in Switzerland, etc. And it's not a requirement from our perspective to be um, deployed in all of the airports, just that whatever incumbent system is in the airport has an open API so that we can aggregate that for our um, end users, our drone pilots, and you get a single interface to request permission wherever you want to fly. Um, and I think that was the point I was making earlier about registration. It's not necessary for every registration provider to speak the same language today. Um, what's important is that every registration provider is able to, to say what language they're speaking, and then UTMs that decide they need to integrate with that can make the decision to do it. Um, and that's effectively how we uh, aggregate aeronautical information today and uh, mapping information. There isn't a global standard for this stuff. You know, there are nearly 90 different data sources feeding into AA. And very few of them follow the same standard, despite being official sort of in-country specified systems. So again, you've got a remarkable responsibility as a UTM company to federate with what's out there, both from a sort of lowest common multiple point of view. It's the easiest thing to do. Um, it also requires the least amount of change from everyone that's currently um, uh, using a deployed system that's tried and tested and has got a lot of reputation to it. So yeah, when it comes to opening the airspace, I wish I could say, yeah, we'll just wave a magic wand and you know every airport will use this new system. But that's why you know we were in Madrid showing that you can have modern technology um, being turned safely into an electronic flight strip, which is surfaced on an existing flight management console that's that's in use in the airport, requiring minimal extra retraining or, or and no extra certification. Um, uh, from the uh, from the manufacturer, but equally then uh, solving the next piece, which was communication. You know, to have an air traffic controller, and maybe Gary can can back me up on this. But you have an air traffic controller, you have a headset, and you use that headset typically to go talk to the aircraft, to be able to press the same button on your console, and then establish a mobile phone call to the drone operator. Means you've not got to take your headset off and pick up a phone or a multitask. You can just get on with the business of managing that drone, more or less as if it was an aircraft. And that means that we're able to get more drones into the airspace because we're not getting the challenge and the pushback from the ATM community that they need new equipment or they need new things and we're asking them to do significantly extra work. So it's a, it's a gentle approach. It will take a long time. Um, but this is a really exciting step and should mean you get a media result very, very, um, very, very early on in the process. And are you, to a large extent, keeping the traditional vendors on team? Um, because I would have gone and bought my, I don't know, let's think of a, 
uh, Rockhall Collins or Talas or someone. I would have gone and bought a big radar, a bossing great big radar for them. Cost me millions. And then I'd need all the communication lines to the tower, and they'd have a friend who'd have done that. And then they'd have probably put the screens in for me and the computers at the back. So the whole ATC buying chain is a chunk of money for all this, this gear. Um, with the internet, with the evil old internet, you're kind of disrupting that because you, you no longer need... Uh, all those big expensive pieces so those big companies i'm going a bit off topic aren't i they must be running scared that young agile companies can come up with internet-based stuff um that not anyone can replicate but it's a lot easier than making a bossing great big radar and going going down that way so why are you keeping them on side a little bit well i think um you know i'd love to think that that what small companies like Altitude Angel, Airmap, Unifly are all doing is scaring the Talis guys or, or scaring the, the huge, huge defense companies that exist. But the bottom line is the, mon the money isn't there right now for this to be a major concern for them. But I think it must be on their, to use a bad pun, must be on their radar because traditionally what companies uh, like that have done, as you just described, Gary, is you, you, you sort of deploy an incredibly expensive capital piece of equipment and then you build all of your software vertically on top of that. So you build all of your systems on top of it. So you need the ecosystem. Whereas actually there are some INSPs in the world today that already have taken that early step to separate the hardware from the software that they use internally. And that's an enormous thing in the ATM industry. Um, certainly not necessarily the most transformative thing in the commercial industry today. But again, there's a lot of regulation and a lot of investment that goes into existing ATM systems. And as I said earlier, you know, you can't just shut it all down and then on Monday bring online a brand new, you know, fully proven, fully tested system. Everything has to to take time. So, um, you said you, so you said you've been to Presswick earlier, I think, before we started, and uh, and, that's, and I've told the story before, but that's exactly where I saw that happen. There was a room full of strips, mechanical way of doing it, a peoplematic way of doing a thing. They put in some new computer software. They needed the room for something else. And so instead of running it, they were going to run it side by side for a couple of months. They didn't because they needed the room. And uh, lo and behold, a week later, the computers fell over and the, the the room was no longer there to do it the old the old way. So I've seen, I've, at, at, at the Oceanic, I've seen a computerized system come in and fail in its first week. Uh, and as you say, it causes chaos, absolute chaos. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this, this is a, a fascinating um, subject. I could talk all night about it, but we probably shouldn't. Um, they, so what, what, what's the bottom line? What's the takeaway about remote ID then? Do we love it or hate it? Or do we only need it where we need it? Well, in the absence of um, everyone else speaking and the fact I can't hear Louis, so I have no idea if he even is speaking, I'll just kind of say, look, I think, you know, there is clearly a use case for remote ID that is not an endorsement for ubiquitous broadcast remote ID or remote ID over cellular or even local remote ID. Um, I think it's to say that, that the concept needs to be solved. There is a clear use case for the local broadcast uh, as well as, as you go forwards in time, needing a network solution of some description. But again, what we don't want to see is the replication of effectively kind of like a digital ADSB, you know, we have to figure out how we now can prove that you are who you say you are, that your message is in fact authentic on the network and that it is authenticated. Um, so it's not simply enough to say I've got, you know, a first name, a last name and a drone ID field and, you know, trust that people uh, will, will do that right thing. I think that, that simply adds burden. It doesn't actually solve the problem. Oh, common sense. It's you know, interesting to note. It's, it's interesting to note also that we have um, driverless cars or, you know, working towards driverless cars and drones that operate on the road. We don't have the equivalent of air traffic control for motor vehicles. We have a set of rules and people follow the rules. You come to an intersection, you give way. Um, and that is how we manage the single largest fleet of mo mobile vehicles on the planet. We do have somewhat an analogous equivalence where we have um traffic lights which is probably the closest we come to air traffic control when it comes to the management of vehicle flows but i, I wonder if we're going to see a multiple tier arrangement where a lot most of the drone traffic is autonomous it works on a set of rules it has things like lidar or whatever it is that we've got with our vehicles and it's able to decide for itself um, what to do when to do it and to stay safe and then a particularly congested 
areas, you may have the equivalent of traffic lights and motorway signs and things for controlling the really heavy traffic, but largely it's going to be uh, up to the individual vehicle to stay clear of other vehicles and to plot its most efficient course from source to destination. I wonder if we'll end up with that and therefore UTMs as such will not be perhaps as big as we think they would be. Well, well there we've got another, another uh, transponder standard, haven't we? Vehicle to vehicle that's coming. So there's, there's another one. So why are we why are we rushing to create another remote or electronic ID? Shouldn't we all just be using vehicle to vehicle so that uh, when my delivery drone flies in towards its hub, the truck can see it coming and I can see where the truck is coming to the hub or maybe the truck isn't at the hub. Why are we rushing to have a standard of identification for the air and for the ground? Surely we should have just, I mean, multiple questions on this, isn't there? Yeah, a couple of, couple of angles there. I think V2V is really interesting, but it's not all about remote ID. V2V is about vehicles in proximity communicating and exchanging information. Some of that information might be the ID, but we don't need V to V to get the ID of the aircraft, right? Um, equally, from a navigation perspective, clearly it's better ahead of time, before the vehicles are in proximity and they can communicate with each other, to plan to not actually need to be in proximity with each other, i.e. let's plan to avoid each other in the first place and then only rely on this vehicle to vehicle communication as a last line of defense. Um, kind of like geofencing today, right? Geofencing is a last line of defense. You know, we rely on the operator to, to plan, to not go and cause problems in controlled airspace. Um, but it's a very similar thing as we start to think about more automated use of drones and going BV loss and flying over longer distances under EV loss. Um, we need different uh, tools and different communication protocols to make these things happen. And uh, identity really becomes much more important when you start removing the visual element um, but again, you then have other questions that also need resolving. So it's great that we've now got remote ID, but unless, as Louis's point earlier was, unless we've got systems in place in the facilities we really care about to actually interrogate those IDs and then to be able to understand what it means, then why are we doing remote ID in the first place? We're not solving that problem. We might as well do, I think, what the FAA did years ago and just require folks to stick a serial number on their actual drone physically. Um, you know, it, it, there are different mechanisms that we need to think about here. Um, but I think the overriding um, message for me would be, someone needs to decide what, what, is the, uh, what is the appropriate thing in their country and who are the operators that they're looking to burden? What are they expecting them to do? Are they expecting them to buy new equipment or can we use a software solution? Um, the answers there are probably, it depends who you are and what you're trying to do and what you're trying to fly. You know, should we require someone flying a 250 gram micro drone to stick a 40 gram transponder on the side of it? Probably not. Um, but should we require someone with a 25 kilo drone flying commercially a kilometer from Heathrow's runway to have some greater level of conspicuity? Yes, probably. Um, and actually those are the folks that are more likely to be able to um, tolerate and actually probably willingly accept that burden than your average recreational user who isn't who isn't going to be doing that. Um, so yeah, uh, you, you can probably tell we're kind of from a technology perspective we're relatively agnostic. It's just an identifier, um, but just an identifier doesn't solve the problem anyone really has. We then need, as I say, the trust and the authentication and the systems that bring it together. And then we need to combine those with the detection systems in place to be able to actually work out who is there and out of the people that are there, who should not be? <laughs> uh, and that's when those things really start to make much more sense. And, and there's, all, there's also the problem that we can see today. For instance, the, the issue that the DJI Geo uh, new release caused to all the DJI guys, and uh, that caused the problem to them. And w whether we go and, for instance, are the pilots adopt uh, whatever system uh, that uh, we can, uh, but then you al always have the Xiaomi's and the China-made uh, drones that can fly and have no means of or uh, or whatever it is to do to, to be uh, identifiable by the systems. Okay, so that's the biggest problem. So then the, bo the bottom line is, so uh, RG Pilot or DJI may adopt a system, your system, and everyone flies by it, but other manufacturers may not uh, may not adopt a system, and so they won't um, won't appear on it. Sorry for you, Rich. 
that actually just entirely broke up for me, Gary. Sorry to do it again. Sorry, the boss. <laughs> Maybe Bruce, Bruce, you have a go. You have a go. Yeah, as long as systems are voluntary, people may or may not comply with them, and therefore you have this dis fragmented thing. The only way this is probably going to work. Uh, Richard has this agnostic, have this layered system for Alt altitude danger where they don't care where they get the information from, so they can work with any system providing it has an open API. But uh, has, are we going to have a mandated standard so that everyone has to do this so that it'll actually work? Because as Louis says, you might have DJI using a system, but the Xiaomi's or something may not use the system, so how do you get the data out of them? It, it does become quite difficult and looks like regulation is the only way to go on that, doesn't it? I think um, regulation probably ought not to say how the technical standard should be implemented. It should simply say what the requirement is. It is a requirement, for example, to fly and broadcast an ID that looks like this in this location so that it can be received by these people at this time or at this distance for this purpose. Um, and I agree, I agree entirely with Louis. You know, I think it's crazy to assume that everyone's just going to comply. Uh, and most people probably will, right? 99% of folks are great, you know, Drone users, they're responsible, they fly safely, they check apps, they do everything. Some people are just idiots and they get it wrong. Sometimes they do it accidentally. Some people will try and do harm, right? And you still need solutions in place, regardless of that percentage mix, you still need a solution in place to be able to look for yourself in the areas that you care most about from a risk perspective. And that clearly today is, you know, some, obviously some sensitivities around airports, but it doesn't stop there. You know, there are um, other types of infrastructure that are certainly at risk potentially more from the attack vectors posed by drones. So you need to have a system which is effectively, you know, trust everyone's going to do the right thing. But actually, you know what? I just want to check for myself. I want to be able to see 10 miles or 15 miles around this location. What's in the airspace? The next step is then going, well, what? Uh, who is in the airspace and are they authorized? So you, it's not enough to then just say, well, I've got a counter drone system and I've deployed the counter drone system and I can see everything. But if you're a counter drone system, everything looks like a target. So you, you then need to blend that with the system, for example, like the one that NATS is deploying, which allows the software itself to say, well, I can see five things in this vicinity. And of these five things, four of these things have been correlated with the permission, but this thing over here, I can't find a permission for it. That's probably my rogue drone at that point. And then I can have a discussion with my security response team to decide how I want to deal with that. But the point is now I know what is the thing I'm worried about, not just getting an unconfirmed report, for example, that there's something in the airspace I should check. I can actually now go do it. So I think we, this is all about getting the basics right. We've got to get a system that allows permissions to be granted digitally to fly in those regions. And we already have that mechanism in law um, in the UK. You know, if you want to fly at Heathrow Airport, you can do it. You just need to get permission to do it, right? So we've got the regulations that says, yeah, knock yourself out, guys. You can do this, but you need to call the tower. You need to get permissions to do it. And this software makes it very easy now to say, well, let's try and do away with a phone call. Let's try and get this permission digitally. But in doing so, we're then also preparing for the arrival of drone detection systems so that we can give that intelligence um, over to the drone detection system so that you don't accidentally become the subject of a security investigation because you're flying there legitimately. So there's lots of angles to that in, well, in how, our view. How, how does that work? It's a pity the guys from Didrone didn't didn't join us. How does that work now? Do you do you share? Do they all say, "Hey, Rich, can we have your data, please?" Did do um do they, <laughs> nice nice shot of the table there, Louis. Very good, very arty, very arty. Um, how does that work now? Do do you send data to anyone? Is there a standard for sending data to counter UAS systems? How does it work? Um, that's a good question. I was just breaking apart a response to something I saw in the text chat there into what I thought was going to be two parts, but it ended up being three parts. So I'm just going to apologize now. There's three of two parts that have been published. Um, but how does it work? So there are data exchange standards that ATM networks use today. Um, a good example uh, there would be something like IKO's DOC 4444 flight plan standard. So for example, that's the standard we use to take a flight request that comes in from a mobile phone or across our API and then surface that as an electronic flight strip through a bunch of other intermediate systems so that it pops up. So there are data exchange standards today. Um, what we're doing as an operating system manufacturer, much like Apple and its iOS 
or Microsoft and, and Windows or Linux, etc. Um, what we're doing is creating a driver standard effectively that allows um, you know, a, a blighter or a D-drone um, or a DJI Aeroscope to make their product work with ours so that we can then uh, effectively, you know, an airport can choose what sensors it wants to deploy or another sensitive facility can choose what sensors it wants to deploy. So, you know, part of our job is to make sure that that standard is published um, in the same way that, you know, if you do want to write a program to run on a Windows computer today, that standard is published and you can do that now. You don't need to go figure out how that works um, or establish a relationship with Microsoft. You just go do it. Um, so that's what we're working on, and in some instances, you know, we're finding there aren't standards for this particular type of information exchange because no one's really needed to do that before. But lots of surveillance systems, for example, do speak a standard known as asterisk, or asterisk rather. Um, even that is a relatively archaic, um, or you could say trusted, tried and tested um, standard. Um, but it is a standard which is known. It's a bit like saying, well, let's exchange lots of information using comma-separated values. You know, we've got better ways of doing this today. Um, but back in the day, when you were building that kind of stuff, that was the accepted standard. So lots of modern detection systems also use that standard. Um, so, you know, when we did Operation Zenith, we made sure that we were able to ingest information in Asterix format. We were able to push information out in the ICAO.44, 44 flight plan format. And then for all of our drone manufacturers that were involved and drone pilots, you know, we were talking to SMS networks over GSM. We were talking to uh, them over 4G using a proprietary telemetry protocols of each of those manufacturers. The point is, the folks sitting in the ATM world had no idea any of that was going on. Each of the other guys didn't have any idea that was going on. They just solved their part of the problem. And the um, so I, I assume then, I, can you will uh, is it a two way street? Can you pull in the data from the drone or blighter as your unidentified traffic? Does it work two ways, or are they only hearing what what you know about? Um, I think it depends on the implementation. I mean, there are multiple conversations we're having with different detection systems today, and some are sort of more open in the sense that they'll accept input as well as provide output. Um, you know, Altitude Angel's platform will accept input and output, but it kind of depends. You know, there are some capabilities in our product that are better at aggregating sensor data from multiple providers because as a drone detection manufacturer, you probably don't have to solve that problem, right? You're, you're building your software to deal with your sensor. Um, one of the big things that a lot of folks don't necessarily think about initially when thinking about the capabilities of sensors is that they have different granularities of operation. Um, some drone detection systems have an accuracy down to say 100 meters or even worse, you know, 150, 200 meters. Um, some of them, on the other hand, kind of work by listening to the control signals coming from the drone. So they're not really detecting, but they're listening, and therefore they relay the exact GPS coordinates as reported by the drone. So you have, you have a very accurate signal. Now, if I've got two of those, those two sensors <coughs> deployed in the same physical location, sensing the same drone, then I've got a big correlation problem because I've physically got one drone in the air but one, you know, one system says it's somewhere in this 250 meter circle, and the other one says, no, it's precisely here. Which do you trust and why? Um, and this is a, what I mean about the, the operating system taking on a, a much grander role effectively. It has to be able to understand the limitations of each of those and still deliver the result to its users, which is different to the result that the drone detection manufacturer is trying to solve on, on their own. Does that help explain that? Yeah, and then I'm just wondering, you know, when when that the, the drone detection people shoot it down, will they say, "Hey, Rich, we shot that one down. <laughs> take that off your list. Take it off. Take it off your remote ID list. It's not there anymore." <laughs> just yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully you wouldn't see it on the detection system anymore, right? Because it's gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Yes. Yes. The sensor. It'd be nice, it'd be nice if you had a message as well, though, just to confirm that one's not completing its flight. Ah, oh, this is this is this is fascinating stuff, and I, I personally, I, 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 what I see is is this rush to be remote ID providers, which I don't think is necessarily uh, a good thing, and I see companies perhaps overselling technologies or ideas and concepts exactly. that just aren't required. They're just not required and and not needed. 
in most circumstances. Yes, if we're flying next to Heathrow on a very expensive commercial job, we need they need to know we're there. Um, but no, not any that, any any. That and some companies that are doing what has been done on the software business side, like FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt for yeah. all, all the other players announcing uh, brand new partnerships with this company, which might be or not an established player on the fields, and no results whatsoever, or perhaps underground results that no one will know until some large purchasing system occurs. So mm, yeah, everybody is after the pay to go, uh, pay to fly. Yeah, Louis is saying the two things which are quite right. Fear, uncertainty and, and doubt are being spread. And the idea of pay to play is not far from uh, a lot of companies' minds, uh, I think. Um, and and that that's a worry. I knew I knew you would you would unpack remote ID nicely for me, Richard. I knew you would. <laughs> it was that's, that's marvelous. A Gorilla drone says, "Will the drone squawk seventy seven hundred if it gets taken out by an anti drone attack?" <laughs> well, surely would. What's hijack? It's seventy six, isn't it? It's a hijack rather than a takeout an emergency. I don't know. Yes, some something like that. Hijack um, by eagle, anti drone eagle. Anti drone eagle. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Change oh, tick, 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 tick. if I had a tried and true method, uh, says uh, 507, it's right, and there's a lot of that in the market. And of course, the newspapers lap it up, they love all this fud, they absolutely love all this fud. If you're in the UK, ITV are on to uh, the Gatwick uh, thing, slightly, slightly different, but they are investigating. Uh, they've spoken quite a bit to me and to quite a few other people, so they're not satisfied with the current answer about Gatwick. Um, but on that note, because look, we're, we're quarter past the hour already. I'm just going to ask, uh, Chaps, was there anything else that caught uh, anyone's eye this week? Yes, yes, there was. Um, first of all, uh, we, we see all these news reports about drones flying near airports and things, and they get massive front page coverage for weeks. We had a Diamond Twin Star flight training aircraft crash here in New Zealand with uh, and two instructors on board, and they both unfortunately passed away. Um, and I virtually saw nothing about it on the news. So here we have an aircraft, a training aircraft with instructors on board crashes, and it's like never happened. But you see a drone um, hovers around someone's bedroom window and it's front page news for weeks. Uh, again, pointing at this whole distortion that the media is doing in terms of you know what's costing lives and where the risks are. The other thing is um, this whole registration thing, we've got countries plunging headlong into it. We've got Canada and Australia going into compulsory registration as of the middle of this year. Um, Switzerland in 2020, and I'm sure plenty of other countries already regist require registration and so forth, never been proven to do anything. And I, I looked, and Canada is actually going to require the compulsory registration of drones, but they gave up on their gun registry. They, they instigated a, a firearms registry that was going to help solve firearms crime and things. And after spending a great deal of money, I haven't found the exact amount, but it, it was millions and millions of dollars, they canned it because it was never proven to solve a single crime or prevent any crime. But they're going to require registration of drones. So you have these, here in New Zealand, we've seen just how dangerous firearms can be recently, but they're not going to be registered in Canada, but they're going to register their drones. And it kind of, it really skews the whole risk and response thing completely. It shows how badly out of touch the whole aerospace industry or the regulators are with this registration thing and finally well, when it comes to electronic well, when it comes to electronic conspicuity i'm wondering if we shouldn't just take this bull by the horns and just make something and start installing it on all our models and drones and then we have control over what the standard is rather than having the regulators come and roll out some prescriptive standard which they may do you've yeah, got to do this and then companies jump on the bandwagon and say okay it's going to cost you a thousand dollars per transponder like adsb was why don't we just roll something out make it cheap make it available start using it and then they'll have to adopt it or you know basically the you know they will not get a wider that's a lot right You've been that's watching my channel uh, there, Bruce, because that's a, for my um, Vertiport Africa, that's, I, I've, I've already published my accepted standards for people to fly in here. I don't care what my regulator does or wants. I've, I've got my, I, I know what I like. And, 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 and I did a simple way of thinking. If I can see the aircraft coming, it'd be very useful for me to see you come in. So best we have standards that I can um, see. And on the, um, so yeah, I, th I, I do think we should adopt one of the, um, 
one of the open source standards start doing it and make it a fait accompli to to the regulator say no this is what we're all using <laughs> don't, don't care what you want we're all using this yeah sorry yeah, Lou, you unless, say unless unless you oh, convince the, the 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 giant in the room to use it forget it um but that's another issue so this week uh, uh, what caught my eye was portugal just entered the, the, the shot the drone season uh, where a drone was shot by a police officer uh, which uh, allegedly was uh, having uh, um, uh, swim on his swimming pool uh, fully naked he saw the drone and he shot it down uh, so yeah okay so that's the the cheeky news of the week and uh, the other in other news we've had uh, on last weekend uh, the Ardu pilot conference with lots of people in there and some uh, nice results that i'll have to publish later this week the, the the video of the sessions which i already excused myself of the sound quality but uh we had some issues there and if everyone still do you remember jordi munoz which was yes. one of of course okay and do you need uh, do, do you also remember nick arsoff and philly yes. talk mouths yes i'm old the, oh Look at this baby. This the newest. That's the X. That's their their uh, Pixoc uh, compatible board, but this time on the same shape as the old one, but with a seven 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 CPU. So a crazy powerful machine, ready to go, and with a very nice price and always with the the flexibility of having whatever configuration you want on the pins very very impressed with the with the, the work uh, that is the sd um where's the SD? i don't see the sd card holder oh it's on the other side as usual okay well i, I was just you know, i have to ask these things but people people will know inquiring minds will want to know richard in our inter internal chat says bring me in on the registration in a bit Here's your bit, Richard. I'm bringing you in. Oh, so the point I was trying to make was Bruce, Bruce made a really good point about suggesting that, you know, actually we should just go ahead and implement this and that should become the standard. Um, that's exactly what's happened today, right? And that's how most technical standards generally um, generally take place. You get a, you have a company that's doing something or a movement of people who publish something and they get traction around it. I think the challenge is, you know, most regulators, you know, they're busy folks, right? And they want to adopt a solution that the industry agrees on. But there isn't a solution right here that the industry agrees on because you've got all good folks in it, probably like us, that are saying, well, why is there a requirement right now to federate our identities of our customers and put that in a central database? And I think there's a classic corollary here. You know, there seems to be a desire on the registration side to register every drone as if it solves a problem. Now, most countries today have regulations around the usage of the internet and the requirement for an internet service provider to track your, your traffic but they do not require the internet service provider to put all of your records into a central database. And I think that's the, an interesting model that we should discuss more here and say, well, do we require the UTM? For example, here in the UK, we have well over 100,000, 110,000 users using our system daily. Do we require the UTM simply to keep those records or do we require the UTM to push them into a central system? Um, and I think that's the challenge here with, um, uh, with the requirement that we should have some big national registry. I don't know what problem that solves. I don't know who wants to take the responsibility for keeping it up to date. Please, sir, did you just say you have 110,000 users a day? Uh, in the UK. Sorry. 110, we have 110,000 100, users in the UK. Is that oh, aircraft oh as well as drones? So that's people. The number of drones is higher. Some people have more than one drone, and our older users have registered more than one drone over time. But that's a huge number of flights quite, a day. It's quite a big number. Um, you know, there are <laughs> it's of... you just said, I, I've done my flab as a gas. You said 110,000 mm -hmm. a day. 
I know, we have 110,000 users in the UK, not 110,000 users oh. flying games. Oh, oh okay, 110,000 users. Uh, that might be a number, I should go check that, but I do know that we have well over 10 to 12,000 drone operations just in the UK on a daily basis. I've got okay. a map I'll put okay. on our blog, actually, um, probably sometime uh, early next month, which will show our worldwide footprint of flight reports, and that number's probably approaching low low hundreds of thousands in terms of people voluntarily sharing uh, where they want to fly. But again, that's different to those users asking us to share their information, their personal information. We're sharing the circles about where they're flying. Um, yeah. but that registry point, coming back to it, was, you know, Altitude Angel has a registration database. I'm sure Unifly does. I'm sure AirMap does. And um, why is there a requirement for us to share that information or put it in a central um, database today. Um, equally, drone manufacturers often have apps that power their drones, and even the biggest drone manufacturers usually require a registration of some description. So they also have a registration database. Um, what we need really is guidance from a regulator to say, well, actually in our country or in that country, this is what we want to happen. We want to create a central database, and it's the responsibility of the drone pilot or the manufacturer when it's sold. Um, to register the drone and put it in the database. But that's a problem if that identity is locked away from the rest of the community that need to use it. It's a bigger problem if the drone pilot, him or herself, have no control over that data. Um, you know, we need to do more with our identity here than lock it into the database. And that's why I think it makes sense for the UTM companies to have a requirement placed upon them to store that information and to agree how and who they're going to um, effectively change that, uh, exchange that information with. But then we also have to consider not all UTM companies are based physically in the location that they're providing services. And in Europe, we have a very strong requirement on something called GDPR, which I think is what Louis just said in the chat. Um, GDPR prevents, in some instances, information being exchanged outside the boundaries of a particular country. Um, if you're a German citizen, you don't want to ship all of your German user data off to a server in, say, California, because th that's illegal. Um, so there are local challenges associated with that. Um, so I think there, are, you know, there is a lot of meaty questions here, but the, the point is the technical one is not the issue, right? When someone says, Alton Angel, you must yield this information to this user, or, or more, rather this authority under these circumstances, we can code for that and we can verify that it is only going to that authority in that circumstance. But I don't think we want to get into the position where people who trust the companies today to look after their personal information are just sticking an API on it and publishing it into some national or in some instances I've seen proposed international database of drone flights. I'm not sure what problem we're seeking as an industry to solve in that regard, but right now we already have registration systems in place. What we don't have is, for example, the ability for a police officer to point their camera at the drone in the sky and interrogate whose it is. Um, maybe if you're happening to point your drone at a particular manufacturer and that you have that particular manufacturer's app on the on the um uh, on the phone today then you could do that with a system like aa in in the in play you could use the altered angel app and we aggregate that information from whatever the incumbent systems are but that's the re that's the job of the regulator to make that mandatory right now lots of people are doing it voluntarily and i think that's a sign of a good responsible industry trying to do the right thing you know, our experience, our genuine experience over the last five years working in this industry has been literally the vast majority of drone operators flying for fun or commercially are trying to do the right thing. They're just trying to do the job. They're trying to comply. They're getting more and more requirements put on them. And it's not getting easier for them to comply. And we're talking right. about additional compliance restrictions, potentially in even more locations than they currently even have to consider now. We're putting, in some instances, much more burden on drone operators than we are as uh, I think Louis pointed out in some instances gun owners um, but also more appropriately GA and other classes of air traffic so I'm curious as to what we're trying to do here um, as, a, as an industry and that's why I come full circle where I, where I started you know I think we got to answer the question on conspicuity more broadly than just for drones yeah yeah 
and did you know what i think on that note because i could keep keep rattling on about this um on that note i think we should wrap up this has been very very interesting Richard. thank you very much and for agreeing to come on and take a bullying from us yet again um, <laughs> it, it, oh. it's such a shame the d drone people didn't turn up i think we could have um I think there's a lot of questions on that D-Drone product and, and we'd have given them a fair hearing and we'd really like to know more about it, wouldn't we, Gary? We would and we could have, and I would have been in, I would, would have been very interested to see how the piece would have worked between UTMs and 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 the sensors. Uh, you know, it, it's an obvious thing that has to come together, isn't it, really? Otherwise, you've well, got a little bit of your own data. Would be, would I know be we're wrapping up, but I'll take 10 seconds just to point out, if you go to the operationsanith.com website, you will see D-Drone was a partner in Operation Zenith, and they actually did um, send a lot of information and receive a lot of information from uh, UTM. So, you know, they've, they've clearly got a desire to be part of that solution and, and not create an independent um, sensor. So, yeah, it's a shame that they, they didn't come along. I don't yeah. know why that is, but um, oh, maybe they'll come on oh, next. Oh, Indeed, indeed. Well, 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 we'll ask you back when that happens. And Louis, do you want to have a one-sided conversation with just two of us? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just just uh, was commenting that uh, 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 the, the regulations that Richard was mentioning, if someone wants to have some fun, please try to, to get uh, commercial flight authorization in Belgium. If you're not, a, 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 if you're not Bel a Bel from Belgium. If you're not from Belgium, you won't get authorizations. So he was saying, a Phil Hunter saying, when is the presentation video of Zenith Operation going to be published online? Zenith is online, isn't it, Richard? It's uh, just answering right now. now. I'm pasting okay. the URL in as we speak. So Richard, we'll put that in the comments now. Dear viewers, wherever you are in the world, thank you very much for watching and putting up with us and all the technical issues that we've had. Don't forget, join us uh, again next week, 2100 GMT. Have a very safe rest of the week. We look forward to seeing you then. E if you want us to talk to anyone, email me or shout at Bruce or something, and, and we'll try and get these people on. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Louis and Bruce. Look after yourselves. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.